This week, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. is visiting the border of one of the world's worst crises. More than five million Sudanese have been displaced by a power struggle between the military and an offshoot paramilitary group. More than 200,000 people from Sudan's Darfur region have fled into Chad, where U.N. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield announced new sanctions and additional humanitarian assistance. Nick Schifrin spoke to her for a look at U.S. policy five months after violence in Sudan broke out. They cross the border with their entire lives on the back of horse-drawn carts and walk dozens of miles carrying the next generation to a safer future. Sudanese refugees arrived by the thousands into Chad so these are families. and were greeted yesterday by U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield. She pledged another $163 million in aid to families fleeing war. Five months of infighting between Sudan's armed forces and rebel rapid support forces, or RSF, has engulfed Sudan's cities and reignited ethnic conflict in Darfur, a region the size of Spain. Twenty years ago in Darfur, government-backed Janjaweed militias committed what the U.S. labeled genocide. Those militias birthed the RSF, which today in the same place is alleged to have launched the same crimes. We are talking hundreds of thousands of people who have really, at this point, no protection force between them and RSF, which is clearly shown, like the Janjaweed from which they are descended, that their intent is to liquidate non-Arab people in Darfur. And to discuss the humanitarian crisis and U.S. policy towards Sudan, we turn to U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield. Ambassador, thanks very much. Welcome back to the News Hour. Uh, you just heard one description uh, of what these refugees that you've been speaking to are running from. What did they tell you? They tell me that they ran because they were afraid. They ran because they saw their neighbors, their friends, their family members killed in front of their eyes. They were raped, as some of the women shared with us. And they were afraid for their future. And they only, their only hope was to seek refuge here in Chad. As we said, much of this violence in Darfur is being committed by the RSF, which is a descendant of the Janjaweed militias who committed genocide 20 years ago in Darfur. If the State Department today has evidence that this is the same group committing similar violence in the same place, let me ask you directly, is today's violence also a genocide? Today's violence is very reminiscent of what we witnessed in 2003 and 2004. We are gathering data and gathering information now. As you know, we've already issued sanctions against, against one individual and visa restrictions on another one. And we will continue to follow this situation very intensely and closely and develop our, our decision based on the facts on the ground. You heard from Nathaniel Raymond, uh, who is in the Sudan Observatory Group, which is funded by the State Department, who is trying to find some of the facts on the ground, uh, earlier say that the RSF's intent is to liquidate non-Arab people in Darfur, like the Janjaweed did 20 years ago. Do you believe that's the case? I believe that we're seeing evidence of that. And is that defined as ethnic cleansing? You know, we, the people we're seeing crossing this, the border are definitely people of the same ethnic descent. They're telling us the same stories of the attacks that are being made on their families, on their villages, on their livelihoods. And as we gather that data, we will make firm decisions about what to do moving forward. But right now, we're holding every person that we are aware of accountable for what they are doing, and we cont will continue to do that. Yesterday, uh, you imposed sanctions on the deputy leader of the RSF, who is also the brother of the commander of the RSF, General Hameti. But some members of Congress want to see more. Why are there not sanctions on General Hameti himself and, indeed, the head of the Sudan Armed Forces, General Burhan? What you saw us announce yesterday was just the start. And we're continuing 
to gather data and put together the facts so that we can move forward on other uh, announcement. On that effort to uh, hold these parties accountable, is there a plan to escalate sanctions? Uh, certainly, there's a plan to continue to impose sanctions. 20 years ago, when the violence was raging in Darfur and the U.S. declared genocide, President Bush uh, repeatedly raised what the Janjaweed militias were doing. Why is President Biden not talking about Darfur? This is what I, I represent, the face, one of the faces of the administration. I'm here because President Biden wanted me to be here. And this is something that the administration is engaging on, and I'm part of that, uh, that engagement. Back then, as you know, the U.S. pushed resolutions through the Security Council uh, that demanded the Janjaweed uh, disarm. Uh, the Security Council authorized troops, of course, to go into Darfur again. Why is that not happening again? Why aren't there more efforts by the Security Council to repeat those actions? Well, you may know that I held, as during my presidency of the Security Council during the month of August, the first open meeting on Sudan. And one of the things I heard during that meeting was that the press, the world, was not paying enough attention. And I made the decision that I would bring uh, members of the press with me here so that we can witness firsthand what was happening on this border. So our efforts in August were the start, and we certainly uh, will continue to focus attention on this issue and particularly in the Security Council. I'm looking forward to returning to New York, where I can share with other members of the Council what I uh, witness here and push for more Council action. Some regional experts told me today that they thought Secretary General Guterres uh, was not aggressive enough on the topic of Sudan. And one senior U.S. official told me that the quote, uh, told me that the U.N. had been, quote, dysfunctional on Sudan. Do you agree? But I have been here on the ground watching U.N. agencies responding, responding in, in ways that are indescribable to save lives. Uh, I walked with UNHCR uh, employees and other U.N. agency employees who are devoting uh, all of their efforts and their time uh, to saving the lives of the people in, in Sudan. So. I will commend uh, that effort uh, here in Chad, and I know that efforts are being made elsewhere to support the Sudanese who are the victims of this brutal war. And finally, let's talk about the regional actors. The United Arab Emirates, uh, in particular, has been a supporter of General Hameti uh, and the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces. Has the U.S. confirmed that the UAE has sent weapons to the RSF in the last few months? We have called for all countries who might be engaged in this war to cease those efforts. Uh, we need to uh, call for peace. We need to encourage these uh, the warring parties to put down their, uh, their weapons. We're supporting efforts uh, to find a peaceful solution, to uh, negotiate a peaceful settlement to this war, because until this war ends, people in Sudan will continue to suffer. And we've made very, very clear any countries that might be engaged in supporting the efforts of the Warren Party should cease those efforts immediately. Forgive me for asking again, has the UAE sent weapons to the RSF? I can't confirm who is sending weapons to, uh, to the RSF. I can say that we know weapons are going in, and we want to uh, urge those countries who are providing those weapons uh, to cease those, those efforts. And you are calling for those countries to cease those efforts. On the other side, uh, of course, we have Egypt, Saudi Arabia, that have historically supported the Sudan Armed Forces. What is the U.S. doing beyond calling for those countries not to fuel the conflict, uh, to stop fueling the conflict? Well, you know that we have been very, very actively engaged in the peace process and trying to bring the parties to negotiate it to a negotiated settlement. Those efforts are continuing. We're supporting the efforts of the Arab League, of the African Union, and all of the regional parties who uh, might be able to influence these warring parties. And today, I met with the president, uh, the uh, transitional president of Chad, and also urged that he uh, continue to actively engage to stop this war. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, 
Thank you very much. Thank you.